Well, welcome to Trinity Church. My name is Dave. If you don't know me, I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, now after singing about God's word, reading God's word, uh, reminding ourselves of the truth uh, in God's word through the Heidelberg Catechism, we get to uh, spend the central part of our service studying God's word. Because ultimately, we need to hear from God. We're bombarded all week long with all kinds of noise clamoring for our attention, clamoring for our allegiance. But above all else, we need to hear from God. And it happens here on Sundays. It happens throughout the week as you read God's word, as you study it uh, with friends, other uh, members of our church here, as we uh, talk about it and try to apply it uh, in our groups on Wednesdays and the Thursday. We, we need to hear from God. Uh, we are studying uh, the life of Jesus as recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, currently, we're in the first of five discourses around which this gospel is organized. Uh, this, this is the Sermon on the Mount, a quite popular uh, passage. It is, uh, has some very memorable content uh, everything from the Beatitudes, DJ talked about two weeks ago, to the salt and light imagery from uh, David Ayler's sermon uh, last week. Uh, we have Jesus' thoughts on anger, lust, divorce, loving enemies, giving heavenly treasure, judging others, and more. And to top it all off, toward the end of the sermon, we get uh, what's commonly known as the Lord's Prayer, and uh, the golden rule. Pretty hard to beat that sermon right there. Uh, this is a jam-packed a sermon full of truth. And we're m moving through it very slowly, taking a couple verses, a little section at a time. So we're going to spend a couple months here as we work our way through the Sermon on the Mount. At the same time with this sermon, it's a very intriguing one as it is both uh, simple but uh, can be notoriously difficult uh, to interpret. And we've come to one of those passages today where we're going to talk about um, Jesus' view on the law and the prophets, uh, Jesus' relation to uh, righteousness and the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. So big questions to be answered here. Um, if you uh, don't have a Bible with you, obviously you can pull one up on your phone. We also have Bibles and seats uh, in front of you if you'd like. And if, if you didn't get a listening guide, you can lift your hand up. Uh, Alex will get you one from the back, gives you a place to take notes, uh, provides you the points in the sermon. Unfortunately, don't have eight of them. Couldn't top a DJ on that. Only got two. But if you'd like one of those, just lift your hand up. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not a iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, pray with me. Father God, oh, we need to hear from you. Uh, I pray you'd uh, give us uh, eyes to see, ears to hear, that we would understand your word. We know that it is spiritually discerned. We need the work of the Holy Spirit uh, to make that happen. Uh, help us see Jesus' fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Uh, I pray that, that we would not seek to uh, justify ourselves, but help us feel the sting of this passage and uh, to leave here uh, not the same people we, we walked in, that we would leave changed because we have encountered you. We pray this in Jesus' good name. Amen.
So to begin, people have a lot of different opinions concerning the Old Testament, particularly, I think, uh, Ten Commandments uh, and the other uh, laws uh, contained in the Old Testament. And uh, often the suggestion is made in one form or another to chuck the Old Testament, chuck the Law and the Prophets, to, quote-unquote, unhitch ourselves uh, from the Old Testament but what we're going to see here, that that is not what we uh, should be doing here in this uh, passage. Um, a story from my hotel life, because that's where I get all my good stories. And uh, my argument here is that we should not treat the Old Testament in the way I think we should have treated this woman's dentures. So a woman calls uh, me because... Unfortunately, she had flushed her dentures down the toilet. It's a problem. I, I was just hoping she would say, you know, my grandkids, you know, but that makes perfect sense. I have kids. Unfortunately, she said, no, no. Somehow, while she was doing her business, the dentures got in, down the toilet they went. And it had been like overnight, so the Family had been using the restroom and stuff like that. And at that point, I was hoping, so she's calling me so that we don't charge her for, you know, destroying our toilet and however we're going to get these things out of the toilet. But, but no, guess what? She wants her dentures back. Really? Like, they... they been in there, like, just, just call it good, okay? She said they were $400 dentures. Yeah, they're, I would take that as a sign. You need to buy new dentures, okay? <laughs> you know, nothing else. Just, just call it good. It, it's time anyways. But no, once our maintenance guy took the toilet off and shook it out <laughs> a long time, here pop out these dentures, and I've never seen somebody so joyful to get such a disgusting item back. Like, don't, don't, just, just call it good. You get, throw it in the trash. You, you don't need those, in, but buy, buy yourself some new ones. It, it, it's time, I promise, that's a sign. And that is, although a, I believe, appropriate response to dentures that got flushed down the toilet, uh, that that is not, uh, should not be our response uh, to the Old Testament. It's, uh, some people want to treat the Old Testament that way, to set it aside, to throw it in the trash. Now that there's new circumstances, new information, you know, it's, it's time for it to go to the dumpster. But here Jesus <laughs> proclaims that uh, the Old Testament, particularly the law, is not to be treated like that. It has absolutely no relation to this lady's dentures. Jesus hasn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. He's instead come to fulfill them, to establish a greater righteousness. So let's dig into these uh, four verses. But before we do that, uh, just to give you a little context uh, for these verses. We've heard in the past two weeks concerning, you know, how those who are blessed by God aren't the people you would expect. Aren't the people you would think. They're the people considered weak and naive by our world. Last week, David Ayler unpacked how Jesus calls his followers to be salt, to be light in this world. And that, that forms the introduction to this a sermon on the mount. Starting with verse 17, it launches into the body uh, of this sermon. It's going to go all the way through uh, chapter 7, uh, verse 12, which uh, concludes the body with, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Isn't that beautiful? It starts with the law and prophets, the body does, ends with, Law and the Prophets, a beautiful inclusio uh, there. And then uh, there's a conclusion to the sermon, a threefold warning to enter in at the narrow gate. 
in, in f- uh, chapter 5, verse 17, our first verse here, you know, we've come to the main thesis statement of this very well-crafted sermon. You know, f- flowing from this thesis, we'll see six examples of this call to greater righteousness. Anger, lust, divorce, oaths, retaliation, enemies. Uh, concluded by a summary statement, end of the chapter, verse, uh, verse 48. Chapter 6 is going to give us uh, three areas of piety before uh, launching in with the rest of the body of the sermon to uh, six different affairs of daily life. So we've got a lot of very good stuff, a lot of exciting stuff coming up. But let's take a step even farther back um, before we narrow our focus on these few verses. How did Matthew uh, couch this sermon? What comes right before? What comes right, right after? Matthew's not just giving us a chronological timeline. He's carefully crafting it so we understand who Jesus is through what he does and through what he says. And if you might remember, right before this sermon, we have Jesus proclaiming the same basic message that John the Baptist Uh, came preaching to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He calls disciples to follow him and evidence is the arrival of this kingdom of heaven through healing people. And and then what happens right after this sermon? Well, the crowd is astonished because Jesus teaches as one having authority, not as their scribes. And then what does Jesus do? He cleanses a leper. He heals a servant. So you want to know how repentance characterizes the followers of Jesus? You listen up to this Sermon on the Mount. You want to know how Jesus' eschatological kingdom looks and who's invited in and who doesn't come in? Well, we'll pay close attention to this Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, has arrived in Jesus' life, death, resurrection, It is inaugurated, but not yet consummated. The arrival of this kingdom represents a major turning point in salvation history. And at the same time, as we're going to see in our passage today, it has a dramatic effect on how the people of God should live. So let's start off. Verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So so why does Jesus say he hasn't come to abolish the law and the prophets? Well, surely this was a charge made against him. If you haven't picked it up in this uh, gospel already, uh, Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah, but there's a significant contingent who are not all that excited to see him. They feel threatened by him. They aren't looking to worship him. They're looking to uh, kill him. You know, think back to Herod chapter two, scheming of uh, ways to kill baby Jesus. Archelaus, the word on the street was that he would be more than happy to do the same. Even the devil in chapter four, um, in the testing of Jesus, is sees that his power and authority is threatened by Jesus's arrival. Jesus' conflict with the religious leaders has just started, but but it's going to ramp up as they feel threatened by him. Jesus doesn't look the way the religious elite expected this Messiah to look. And, And they certainly charged him with trying to abolish, set aside the Old Testament law and prophets. And undoubtedly, this was a charge brought against the early church too, as the church didn't treat the Old Testament the same way those within Judaism did. So, you know, Matthew preserves uh, this objection with Jesus's rebuttal of it. And this is the law and the prophets. So that's shorthand for the entire Old Testament, the entire Jewish scriptures. But, but there's a little bit more here. Uh, 
the law, so first five books of the Old Testament written by Moses uh, called the Torah. Uh, but, but here's the problem for us. When, when we hear the word law, you, your first thing that probably pops in your mind is a bunch of rules in you know, our daily life enforced by government, um, in you know, biblical, you know, like, well, right, it's enforced by God. Uh, the most popular ones for Christians to think of in the Old Testament are the, the Ten Commandments. But, but if, you, if you've read the uh, first five books of the Old Testament, you know that there, there's a lot of them in there, 613 to be exact. And, and if this is our primary focus, we miss the boat as to what uh, Jesus uh, has not come to abolish. The, the law is Israel's call to be God's special people. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, of Jacob, made a covenant with the people he chose. He proved his love by bringing them out of Egypt on the Exodus. He gave them the promised land. The, the law is this covenant relationship between God and his people. It certainly includes all those rules, all those regulations, Ten Commandments, certainly includes that, but those demands can never be separated from this covenant relationship between God and his people. And Jesus has not come to abolish the law, and when he says law, that's what he means. Prophets. So, so that's the, the rest of the Old Testament, which builds off the law. Now, our first thought, when you think of prophets, you think of foretelling the future. Maybe you think back to our study of the book of Daniel, and there were some pretty crazy things uh, Daniel had in there. Some things we weren't all that sure about what exactly future events they, they point to. And although that is very true, uh, we're tempted to think that that's what prophets were doing most of the time. But, but actually, most of the prophetic work in the Old Testament wasn't so much pointing forward and foretelling the future, but was looking back at the law and telling God's people, hey, this is what God said to do. You're not doing it. So, so what's up? Well, do you not understand that if you continue to live in disobedience, continue to disregard what God has said, the covenant curses are coming upon you. Uh, you, you think the covenant blesses, blessings are all yours, but actually it's the covenant curses. And in the next few weeks, we'll, we'll see evidence of Jesus's prophetic ministry as uh, he takes uh, what his audience has heard and, and provides a prophetic interpretation of it but, but not just any prophetic interpretation, the long-awaited messianic prophetic interpretation. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And this leads to our, our first implication of the arrival of the kingdom of heaven through the ministry of Jesus and the establishment of his new kingdom ethic. And that is that Jesus came to fulfill the law, and the prophets. Verses 17 through 18. So here's the million dollar question. What exactly do we mean, does Jesus mean, when he says fulfill? Dale Allison gives a bunch of options. And let me just confuse you even a little bit more and provide you some of them. I have not come to abolish but to establish, to validate the law. I have not come, another option, I have not come to abolish, but to perfectly observe the law. Is that what he means when he says fulfill? I have not come to abolish, but to complete the law through the arrival of a new law. I have not come to abolish, but to, another option is bring out the original intention of the law. I have not come to abolish, but to, enable others to meet the demands of the law. All right, so maybe, maybe your head's spinning. You didn't know there was that many options. You thought, fulfill, it's just one word. It's pretty simple. It goes, let's, let's move on. Um, but, but much, much debated. Uh, the best 
place for us to look, though, for what does it mean that Jesus has come to fulfill the law and the prophets is to look at all the fulfillment that's already happened in the book of Matthew. We've seen this over and over again in the first four chapters. This isn't the first time this has come up. This would be the first thought on the original reader's mind of, oh, wait, 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 wait. This has been happening all throughout the ministry of Jesus. Matthew 1, 22 through 23. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Chapter two, verses five through six, it doesn't, or this one doesn't say the word fulfilled, but this is definitely a formulaic statement of fulfillment. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written, idea of fulfillment here, by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. Verse 15. And remain there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. A couple verses later. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Verse 23 of chapter 2. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Then in chapter 3, baptism of Jesus by John. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. One more. Chapter 4, starting with verse 14. So that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of Galilees, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. So Jesus saying he has come to fulfill the law and the prophets in this sermon carries a related meaning to this fulfillment that we've seen all throughout his ministry already. The point isn't him perfectly obeying the Old Testament or establishing it. He's bringing it to its intended completion. This is what the law and the prophets always pointed forward to. They, they are not just set aside, not abolished, not thrown in the trash. They see their fulfillment their completion in the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah. And then look, next verse. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not a iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So what is this iota dot referring to? This is both this, you got the smallest Hebrew letter, Yod, and a stroke of a letter, maybe a hook or a projection of a Hebrew letter. Idea, this small, these smallest, least significant parts could easily be skipped over. You'd still understand what the word is. Even these are, are quite important. In Hebrew manuscripts, uh, would a scribe change what was written? A faithful scribe? No, no. Even, even uh, what I love, uh, one thing I love about Hebrew scribes is that even when they would see a word that's obviously a misspelling, it's, a, you know, it's got the wrong consonant, certainly somebody before them miscopied it. Well, would, would they change the text to what, I mean, it's got to be that. Well, no, 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 they wouldn't touch the text. They'd write in the, the side how you, you should read it 
as this, but, but they're not altering the text. The rabbis in Jesus' day believed that changing even a single letter would have a very destructive effect. And here, heaven and earth have to pass away before the smallest, unaccomplished Hebrew letter, stroke of a letter, pass away from the law and the prophets. Heaven and earth passing away is a supremely difficult concept for us to even think of. But at the same time, this is an eschatological reality at the very end. The point It's inconceivable to think of even the most minute part of the Old Testament passing away until Jesus accomplishes it all, making it abundantly clear that nothing is being set aside, nothing is thrown in the trash, nothing is abolished. Jesus is fulfilling it all. At the same time here, it doesn't say that the law and the prophets are valid until heaven and earth pass away. A quick read, you might come to that conclusion. But no, no, they are not passing away until Jesus accomplishes, fulfills them, fulfills them all. And let's stop right here before we continue on in the passage. What does it mean for us that Jesus has come to fulfill the law and the prophets, not abolish them? At the very most basic level, we cannot chuck the Old Testament out the window proclaiming ourselves to be New Testament Christians. We believe the Old Testament reveals the same God of the New Testament. You want to know God? You're, you're going to want to read the whole book. Now, not just, not just the last third of it. You're going to want to read the whole book. We believe Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets. Therefore, we should want to diligently study the Old Testament, not forsake it. Uh, Also, we are not under the Old Testament law. We we do not read the Old Testament the same way Jewish rabbis espousing Judaism do. Why? Because we believe Jesus has arrived, that he has come to fulfill, bring the law and the prophets to their intended completion. What they had always pointed forward to. He has ushered in his kingdom. It's inaugurated, but not yet consummated. And lastly, the the law and the prophets should not bog us down in our Bible study or Bible reading. Instead, they should cause us to love Jesus more. Jesus' fulfillment, as we've seen in these first few chapters of Matthew, Jesus' fulfillment of the Law of the Prophets isn't as simple as a, a basic child matching game of, oh, it said he'd have this color hair, and we see he has this color hair. You know, it, it, it's, as we've seen, it's far deeper than that. It's something that we will spend our lives being in awe of Jesus and seeing more and more of Wow, that's how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament expectation for him. I, you know, I know I value his fulfillment of the law and the prophets more today than I did five years ago. And I hope that five years from now, I see even clearer glimpses of how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. But what does Jesus call his people to if we are not under this Old Testament law. Well, Jesus calls his people to greater righteousness. Verses 19 through 20. Verse 19. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So this verse builds off the previous two verses, stressing the continued importance of this Mosaic law. Why? Well, Jesus isn't going to present a bulldoze it all, start all over revelation. This isn't plan B 
This is a fulfillment of the law and the prophets. This is what the Old Testament always looked forward to. It has arrived in the person and work of Jesus, the Messiah, who is accomplishing it all. Dale Allison insightfully writes, fulfillment can only confirm the Torah's truth, not cast doubt upon it. And while Jesus's new demands may surpass the demands of the Old Testament, the two are not contradictory. That's it. Absolutely right. The law and the prophets are not set aside or abolished. Jesus, the Messiah, the promised prophet, eschatological prophet has arrived. The Old Testament now takes on a new role, a role transformed by Jesus's fulfillment. Jesus's accomplishment of the Old Testament through his first and second comings shouldn't lead us to lawlessness. In case you have any doubt about that, just come back for the next six weeks. I promise you. Uh, it, it, gets, it gets really, really tough. And we're going to see in this next verse uh, what uh, Jesus says that is awfully radical. Finish up uh, verse uh, 19, though. So if you relax one of the least of the commandments and teach others to do likewise, you're a least in the kingdom of heaven. What, what does that mean? The, the original audience certainly would have understand, understood uh, the difference between a central teaching of the Old Testament and one that could be considered lesser. At the same time, it's all God's revelation. The main point here is that the punishment fits the crime. I, I love this rhetorical effect. You, you relax the least, you are the least. You treat God's revelation as unimportant. Well, guess what? God treats you as unimportant in the kingdom of heaven. And then don't miss the inclusion of teachers in this. Teaching comes with an opportunity and responsibility to teach, to ignore, set aside. God's word is not taken lightly by the one who gave his word. And then we hear, have on the flip side here, you, you treat God's word as you should, and you'll be called great in the kingdom of, of heaven. See the emphasis on teaching and doing, not interested in just proclaiming with one's mouth what one does not actually live out. And then uh, Jesus concludes the, this paragraph with the thesis statement for the body of the Sermon of the Mount. For I tell you, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Ouch. Ouch. Well, let me unpack why this is such a shocking statement. So who, who were the scribes? Who were the Pharisees? They were the righteous ones that everyone looked up to in that day. Scribes, professional teachers, students of the law. Pharisees were a more a lay movement devoted to strict observance of the law and of legal traditions. The, the Jesus Storybook Bible calls them the extra super holy people. And that, that's about right. But at the same time, during Jesus' day, Jesus is going to mock them, but, but most people didn't uh, take jabs at them, didn't mock them. The average Jew looked up to them thinking, wow, I, I could never be like that. I, I, could, I could never be that righteous. I could never be that good. And here is Jesus coming onto the scene saying that you've got to surpass their righteousness if you just want to enter the kingdom of heaven. So, so that brings up the question, how are we going to do this if they were so devoted to scrupulous obedience of the law? Is Jesus calling his followers to out-Pharisee the Pharisees and be even more meticulous in their observance of the law? Thankfully, no. Because A, it's not too... Wouldn't be good news for us. And B, uh, if, if you've 
met some of Jesus's disciples and followers, that that wasn't going to be happening for them. So take one, for example, Peter, a uh, great guy, but let's be honest, Peter isn't out Pharisee-ing the, the Pharisees, and, and the rest of these guys aren't either. So, so what's, if Jesus says we need to have righteousness that exceeds the scribes and Pharisees, what's his beef with the scribes and Pharisees? Well, it's not concerning the external purity. It's a heart issue. They may have covered all their bases externally, but if one's inner disposition does not correspond to the external actions of righteousness, it matters little. It matters not at all. You know, we saw in the Beatitudes uh, that this type of righteousness doesn't count in God's book. The type of obedience that God's looking for is motivated by a vibrant relationship with and love for God, the God who gave the commandments, not just a duty, not just putting on an external show, mustered up power to just do it. And this is the kingdom of the the ethic of the kingdom of heaven, which Jesus calls his people to greater righteousness than even the most righteous people in their world. Wow. So, so how should we apply this passage? That's oft discussed topic in church history. Uh, Martin Luther relegated the primary use of this passage and then of the six examples that are going to follow, what we'll study in the next few weeks here, to uh, their importance to show unbelievers that they couldn't live up to God's standard. Uh, Ray, Ray Comfort uh, picks that up in his uh, evangelism approach these days. And, and although valid, I would argue that that's not the main point of what Jesus says here, not the main point of the uh, examples we'll see in the the coming weeks. This isn't something you you and I have perfected yet, but this is, it 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 is not an unattainable pie in the sky vision. It is a call to greater righteousness and kingdom ethic of the followers of Jesus. This is something we should be growing in to look more like Jesus, look more like this kingdom ethic as we grow in grace. So let's talk this week about how we value the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees too much and value too little the kingdom ethic of righteousness Jesus is calling us to. It's important important to talk about that because Jesus says that the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees won't get you into the kingdom of heaven. We tend to prefer looking like everything is all fine on Sundays. We we tend to, to prefer that type of Christianity over honesty in our fight against sin a fight to live for Jesus, a fight to um, have the righteousness that's described in this Sermon on the Mount. We, we, we proclaim with our mouths that we love Jesus with all our beings, but do our lives actually reflect that reality? Or, or does money, does comfort seem to take precedence? Ha- question for you. Have you been in Christian circles so long that you could do the right things, put on the right external actions, the right external show without your heart being in the correct place, without a heart of love for Jesus, doing it entirely out of duty to please people instead of to please Jesus and delight in him. We need to fight that temptation vigorously. And and how do you react to these admonitions to righteousness? We're we're Protestant, right? 
When we believe in Jesus's imputed righteousness that we desperately need Jesus to gift us his righteousness. Our righteousness is as filthy rags and we need his righteousness when we stand before God. We need it credited to us. But that, that righteousness should motivate and enables through the work of the spirit, this personal righteousness, this righteousness that exceeds the scribes, that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Does it bother you when I talk like that? Are you uneasy? It, you shouldn't be. You don't understand the Reformation if you don't connect meeting with Jesus and being justified by him with being changed by him to look more like him. And just, just a forewarning, if you're uneasy with this thesis statement concerning greater righteousness, than that of the scribes and Pharisees, just wait for the next six weeks as we dig into these examples of fleshing out. So, so what does this righteousness greater than that of the scribes and Pharisees, what does that look like for us? Do you value the righteousness that Jesus places such a premium on greater righteousness, and not greater because we're out Phariseeing the Pharisees, not going to do that, greater because you're obeying God with the right heart attitude. You do what he says because you love God, you delight in, delight in him, that is your greatest desire. You want to obey no matter who is watching because ultimately God is the audience that matters. If you're not a Christian here, the call in this passage is not for you to try to produce this greater righteousness on your own. Hopefully you see that, you, you feel it inside yourself. The call is to enter into relationship with this Jesus, just as his disciples and close followers had done. You need his perfect life credited to your account. You need his death in your place. But he doesn't leave you where you are. He radically transforms you. He gives you his spirit, the Holy Spirit. And then this call to greater righteousness, Jesus's kingdom ethic actually makes sense and becomes what you most want to do because you love Jesus and desire him above all else. Pray with me. Father God, we confess that we are often a lot more like the scribes and the Pharisees than we care to admit. We often place a premium on external appearances of righteousness we tend to minimize the internal heart motivation. I, I pray you would call those here who are not Christians to faith and repentance, that they would turn for the first time away from trusting in their righteousness, their ability to improve themselves, to trusting in your righteousness realizing their desperate need for you and that, that you would change them. I, I, I pray for those of us who are here who are Christians, that, that I pray we'd feel the sting of this passage, this greater righteousness than that of the scribes and Pharisees. That, that we would forsake our tendencies to prioritize external righteous actions over hearts that love you and want to look like you. I, I pray we'd be changed this week and in the coming weeks as we unpack this more and more. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.